The first X-plane, X standing for experimental, was conceived in 1944 at the tail end of World War II by the US Army Air Force and the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the forerunner of NASA. Its goal was straightforward, to break the sound barrier. Bell Aircraft Corporation was given the contract to build the plane and at the end of 1945 it handed over the first Bell X-1 for testing. The X-1 was designed to travel as fast as a proverbial speeding bullet, so it made sense that it should be shaped like a bullet with wings. The fuselage was modelled after a Browning .5 caliber machine gun bullet, which was known to be stable in supersonic flight. No bulges such as a bubble cockpit were allowed, so the pilot had very poor visibility. In fact, from where he sat, he had no view at all to the rear, and only a very poor one looking forward, given the gentle slope to the nose and the bank of dials and switches which were piled high in front of his face. There was also a problem escaping from the plane if something went wrong. The bullet shape didn't provide enough room for an ejection seat. There was a little side hatch the pilot could squeeze out of in a dire emergency, but he'd have to be pretty desperate because right behind the hatch was the wing, and if by some miracle he missed that, he'd likely be thrown up into the tail. Given that the choice was between staying with the plane or ending up as mincemeat, it's no surprise to hear that the X-1 program didn't see a single bailout. As far as propulsion went, the X-1 was all rocket. The rocket motor had four chambers and there was a choice to fire one or more chambers at a time, but once they'd been ignited, that was it. They'd burn full on until all the liquid fuel was used up or they were shut off completely. At maximum thrust with all four chambers firing, the X-1 had just two and a half minutes of power. To save its precious fuel for boosting it to record high speeds rather than the mundane tasks of getting off the ground and climbing the first 20 or thousand feet, the X-1 was carried aloft by a B-29 Super Fortress and mated to its mothership by a standard heavy-duty bomb shackle. The name of Charles Chuck Yeager is synonymous with the X-1 and the smashing of the sound barrier, but he wasn't the first to take the controls of the flying bullet. That honour went to Bell Aircraft's chief test pilot, Jack Woolhams. Although only in his late twenties, Woolhams had already, in September 1942, become the first person to fly a fighter non-stop from coast to coast across the United States, and the following summer had cracked the world altitude record for an aircraft reaching 47,600 feet. Woolhams was a consummate prankster. During the war, he was at the Material Command Flight Test Base, later part of Edwards Air Force Base, California, putting the new Bell XP-59A through its paces. This was America's first military jet and a top secret project, so when it was towed from its hangar to the run-up area, a fake propeller was attached to the nose to disguise its true nature. Still, Woolhams couldn't resist the opportunity for a practical joke even if it meant breaching security. During a daylight XP-59A mission in the fall of 1943, he noticed a P-38 Lightning from a nearby training unit flying in the same area. Taking off his flight helmet, he slipped on a furry mask and short-brimmed hat and eased the jet alongside the P-38. The Lightning's pilot must have got the shock of his life when he saw the sleek propellerless plane barely 20 feet away being flown by what appeared to be a gorilla in a derby hat, waving a cigar. In January 1946, Woolhams found himself in a very different situation. He was 8,000 feet up in a B-29, climbing down a ladder and into the tiny cockpit of the X-1, nestled partly inside the bomber's dark underbelly. At 28,000 feet, the countdown to launch began, and at zero, the small rocket plane was released into the dazzling light of day for its maiden flight, an unpowered cruise back to Pine Castle Army Airfield near Orlando, Florida. Nine more such outings followed before the first X-1 was taken back to Bell Aircraft for some modifications. A new series of tests was to begin in September 1946, but they would be flown by another pilot. At the end of August, Woolhams was flying over Lake Ontario in a P-39 Air Cobra, a single-seater that had been one of the most successful American fighter aircraft of the war. 
He was preparing for the upcoming national air races in Cleveland and nudging the P-39 up towards 400 miles an hour. Suddenly and inexplicably, it went out of control, plunging into the water and breaking up on impact. Luhmann's body was recovered four days later. The X-1 tests resumed, but by the following summer the Air Force had grown impatient with the progress of the project. Bell aircraft were running what the brass considered to be too slow of a build-up to the assault on Mark I, the speed of sound. Bell's contract for testing was cancelled and responsibility for going through the sound barrier handed to the Army Air Force Flight Test Division. The Army part of that title was soon to be dropped as the US Air Force became a separate service in September 1947. The new chief test pilot was Chuck Yeager, a World War II veteran blessed with astonishingly acute 2010 vision, which once enabled him to shoot a deer at 600 yards. During the war, he was the first pilot in his P-51 Mustang group to ace in a day, accounting for five enemy planes in a single mission. He was also one of the few Allied pilots to shoot down a German jet, a Messerschmitt ME-262. After a couple of months flying the X-1, Jaeger was nudging it very close to the sound barrier. At speeds of Mark 0.95, 95% of the speed of sound, the plane was getting buffeted a lot by the turbulent air piling up around it. No one quite knew what was going to happen when the aircraft finally went supersonic, because there were no useful wind tunnel data. Models had been put in wind tunnels and subjected to air moving at supersonic speeds, but the shock that formed on the models at about Mark 0.9 would simply bounce off the walls and block the airflow. So what happened between about 10% below the speed of sound and 10% above it were more or less a mystery. <laughs>